Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon. Yeah. My name is Peter Ku, and I am the chair of the Committee on Technology. We are here today to discuss the progress, challenges, and future of Link NYC. Link NYC is a communications network owned and operated by City Bridge, a consortium of companies that receive a franchise uh, for, uh, with, city, with the New York City to replace all of the city's public pay phones uh, with five, five kiosks. These kiosks, uh, also known as the links, uh, don't just provide free telephone, uh, I'm sorry, uh, don't just provide free wireless internet. Links have numerous features, including USB uh, charging hubs, the ability to make free local calls, digital ad space to showcase community events, and in past lo location information uh, for nearby MTA buses. These links come at low cost to the city. The franchise agreement also establishes a fee schedule by which the city is expected to receive revenues from Link NYC that would total over $500 million for the initial turn of franchise. This committee acknowledges the potential of the Link NYC program, but we must also address these challenges. Link NYC has faced installation delays and limited installation in Bronx, Brooklyn, and Queens, and Staten Island. News reports state that some delays have been caused by lawsuits and citing issues. And in communities like mine in Flushing, Queens, there are no links available. This is in stark contrast to Manhattan, uh, with over 900 links, uh, where over 900 links are installed. In response to the limited distribution throughout the five boroughs, the city proposed an amendment to the franchise uh, on April 16, 20, uh, 2018, that adjusts the schedule of link installation. The proposed agreement specifies an annual number of links required in each borough. Further, it will require City Bridge to replace 5,000 public pay phones by 2028. This extends the initial term for two years and will call for 2,500 fewer links. In addition to installation charges, advocates have been concerned about privacy issues related to the links, including to their collection of data and front-facing video cameras. The New York City uh, Civil Liberties Union call for changes to the Link NYC privacy policy to address these issues. In response, Link NYC updated their privacy policy and added limitations on how links use the cameras. We look forward to hearing from the administration and City Bridge on the current state of the Link NYC program and how the updated franchise agreement can improve the rollout of the program and moving forward. We also look forward to hearing from advocates on their experiences with Link NYC. With that, I call on the administration to uh, testify. Uh, but before that, I want to acknowledge uh, uh, the presence of uh, Council Member Bob Holden on our committee. So, and I'd like to ask our council to swear the. Um, the administration in. Mm. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth and to answer truthfully to council member questions? I do. Yes. You may proceed. Thank you. Yeah. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Ku and members of the Committee on Technology. Uh, my name is Michael Pastor, and I'm the general counsel to the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications, known to all as Do It. Uh, seated with me today is Ann Koenig, Senior Director of Public Communication Structures. We are pleased to update the committee today about Link NYC, the city's pioneering effort to build a network of free Wi-Fi kiosks across the five boroughs 
at zero cost to taxpayers. As of today, over 3.7 million subscribers have taken advantage of the super fast Wi-Fi at over 1,500 live kiosks citywide. When fully built out, Link NYC will be comprised of at least 7,500 kiosks, making it the largest, fastest free municipal Wi-Fi network in the world. The program is already a cornerstone of Mayor de Blasio's goal to provide affordable, reliable, high-speed broadband to New York City's residents and businesses by 2025. Our collaboration with our franchisee, CityBridge, in addition to feedback and support from stakeholders across the city, including the City Council, continue to make this project successful. Do It Overseas Link NYC, which is made possible through a franchise to replace New York City's outdated payphone infrastructure with gigabit speed Wi-Fi kiosks. Links offer several other free services beyond Wi-Fi, including free nationwide calling, direct access to 911, mobile device charging, and a tablet interface that allows users to connect with 311, social services, transit information, wayfinding, and more. These services are completely free because the advertising on the Link NYC kiosk sustains and funds the entire project, ensuring that taxpayers aren't paying a dime for any of these benefits. In fact, this program is revenue positive, guaranteeing a minimum of more than 500 million, re 500 million in revenue to the city over the course of the franchise. Currently, Link NYC is in year three of construction. Citywide, there are 1,747 Link, Link NYC kiosks installed, 1,508 of which are active. We've made it a priority to ensure that the public can track deployment, which is why uh, we made the locations of kiosks both active and in the pipeline available via data sets and maps on the city's open data portal. I'm also happy to announce that Do It and City Bridge, with the support of Council Member Kalos and Chair Ku, will be making more information available on NYC open data. Very shortly after Commissioner Saini's arrival to Do It in February, he prioritized this work, conveying how important it is that New Yorkers are able to track in near real time the location and status of every Link NYC kiosk. We are grateful to Council Member Kalos for his advocacy in this space, and we look forward to getting this information in the hands of New Yorkers. The Open Data Portal is only one of many outreach tools we have been using to communicate with New Yorkers about the program. Per an agreement with the five borough presidents, Do It and City Bridge, have been proactively seeking comments from local stakeholders on proposed new uh, Link NYC kiosk locations. These are locations that are not replacing payphones. This process includes a notice of proposed kiosks to community boards, council members, borough presidents, and bids for a 60-day comment period. In many cases, this extra step has been tremendously useful for both Do It and City Bridge to gain local insight as links are being deployed. This is especially true outside of Manhattan, where there has historically always been a smaller payphone footprint. Our community outreach has also been helpful to get the word out, because Link NYC will only be successful if the public fully makes use of it. We've already seen widespread adoption of all the services available on the kiosks, and the usage will only increase as more are installed and activated. As of today, 3.7 million subscribers have initiated 72, 722 million Wi-Fi sessions, consuming a total of 4,728 terabytes of data cumulatively. For perspective, this amounts to approximately 2.3 million New Yorkers' typical monthly 2 gigabyte per month data plan. And I'd like to mention that all of this use will soon become an even more secure experience thanks to the commitment we recently got from CityBridge to use a domain name server platform recommended by the New York City Cyber Command. And it's not just the Wi-Fi that residents and visitors are using. In the first quarter of this year alone, users placed over 9,100 911 calls and more than 1 million non-911 calls. They're also taking advantage of relevant content on the tablet, interacting with the 311 function over 17,000 times, and using the Aunt Bertha app, which connects users with local social services approximately 15,700 times. Just last week, we were proud to have supported the New York City Council's participatory budgeting efforts by allowing constituents to vote for projects in their districts directly on the tablet. Voters took advantage of this function over 5,000 times in just seven days. We're proud that Link NYC is built upon technology that allows the city to consistently find new and innovative ways to make Link's true digital public service assistance, ready and able to deliver New Yorkers information they need. Citywide, New Yorkers are seeing, are seeing citywide efforts a citywide effort for weather updates, breaking news alerts, and emergency messaging via links. We've expanded interactive services, offering residents the opportunity to enroll in healthcare, find their polling place, and more. And a on a hyper-local level, over the past years, links have featured community board websites on the tablet, promoting com full community board meetings and local small businesses on the ad, stream, ad screen, and introduced more useful real-time information, such as transit states. 
In fact, we were extremely pleased to work with uh, Council Member Lander and Chair Ku earlier this month to announce the addition of real-time bus information on all links within 0.3 miles of a bus stop into the suite of useful content that the ad screens have to offer. I should note that this is all in addition to the 5% of advertising reserved for mayoral agencies. Just a few examples of some of those public service announcements that have run on links recently include DOT's Vision Zero Creative, FDNY's recruitment campaign, and Do Its Own Open Data Week Fun Facts. We welcome any other ideas from the council and would be more than happy to work with you to get more interesting and useful information to New Yorkers via Link NYC. As I've discussed throughout my testimony today, the services Link NYC offers and the revenue the program generates are extremely important to do it and the administration and to New Yorkers at large. It has become a ubiquitous component of our great city, city streetscape and its continued success is our priority. That's why, in partnership with CityBridge, we are proposing amendments to the franchise agreement to the Franchise and Concession Review Committee. As of April 16th, these amendments are public record and we plan to present the amendments to the FCRC on May 7th. These amendments do not affect the two most important pillars of the program, the number of kiosks built, both citywide and per borough, and the guaranteed revenue it generates for the city, which remains by contract to be in excess of half a billion dollars over the life of the franchise. Under the proposed amendments, kiosk rollout would, kiosk rollout would adjust somewhat, allowing 10 rather than eight years with uh, amended yearly targets. Additionally, the amendments would allow the franchise more flexibility to site kiosks replacing payphones, which could help the city further its goal of equitable distribution in all five boroughs. These adjusted siting requirements would continue to be subject to do its oversight and approval. The amendments will also allow City Bridge to delay some revenue payments above the annual guarantee in the next few years with repayment to the city above the guarantee plus 10% uh, interest. With these modest concessions in return, do it re would require City Bridge to provide a more detailed long-term plan for rollout over the course of the entire franchise, as opposed to year-to-year -year plans currently required. Uh, most importantly, we fought for as much equity as possible within the boroughs, ensuring, ensuring that each community district will have at least as many links as there were payphones. As franchise administrators, the decision to propose amendments was not taken lightly. Uh, the proposal takes into account lessons learned and unforeseen circumstances confronted over the first two years of this first of, it, of its kind initiative. I anticipate that City Bridge will explain in more detail uh, during their portion of the testimony. Thank you all for giving us the opportunity to testify before the committee today. We look forward to continuing our work with this committee and Chair Ku to bring Link, Link NYC to even more New Yorkers and visitors. We welcome your feedback and we are happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Uh, we are also joined by Councilmember Landers and Councilmember uh, Yeager. Thank you for coming. Yeah? Yeah. Glad to be here. Yeah. So uh, I will ask a few questions. Yeah. You, you also have a testament? No. Oh, no. No. Thank you. Um, so what is the overall timeline for when the link kiosks will be installed throughout the city? Uh, the overall timeline pursuant to the amendments we propose would be uh, a 10 year rollout for 75 kiosks throughout the city. So that would be full completion in all five boroughs, 7,500 kiosks citywide by 2025. Okay. And like, how many links will be installed by the end of 2000, uh, fiscal year 2018? And how many of these lanes will be uh, operational by the end of uh, fiscal 2018? By the end of, um, actually we go by calendar year, which ends, I'm sorry, franchise term year, which ends July 21st rather than July 1st. And um, at the end of that time, there will be 653 active link kiosks. 653 okay. active. For just this year, but the total, the total by this July? 1653 oh, 1653, active. there you go. We're at a little over 1500 now, 1653 by July 21st. And my understanding is that one of the reasons for the amendment uh, was to provide timelines for the link activation process. I also learned that it takes a lot longer for links to be installed and activated in Queens Brooklyn and Staten Island, sometimes double the amount of the time uh, than those installed in uh, Manhattan and Bronx. So is there a reason why the timeline is so different? 
So if I could just uh, start by saying, uh, Councilman Roku, I mean, it, it's our top priority that these um, links are active and that they're everywhere. Um, that's what we've been focusing on to date, and that's what we focus as part of the amendment. I think to answer your question, what, what really this comes down to is lesson learned about a, a first-of-its-kind program. And what we're proposing with City Bridge is an amendment that reflects sort of more uh, of reality as to how long it takes to get, uh, to get this done. Um, but I think that one of the things that is included in the amendment that we as do it are really excited about um, is a, a firmer requirement to have a, a full build-out schedule for the 10-year period. So if the amendment is approved by the FCRC, uh, the City Bridge uh, will prepare a, a, a build-out schedule which will show street corridors throughout the city, not just in Manhattan, everywhere. And it'll give us a picture of where they're going to go over the remaining seven years. And in addition, the amendment has a requirement that each year uh, City Bridge actually proposed uh, the specific sites. So what we're going to have is a lot more daylight into for each year where the kiosks are going to actually go, and then daylight into sort of where they'll be when all is said and done. Um, so what is the minimum re revenue that the city will receive? It's uh, over $500 um, a million, uh, dollars, yes. So are there any reason why this the number may change over time, no? No, none whatsoever. And I should just uh, point out, uh, Councilman Raku, that um, in addition to it being a, a program uh, that is of no cost to the taxpayers, um, it's a revenue-generating program, but it's also a program where City Bridge is obligated to bear all costs. So I think it's worth noting that it's not only revenue to the city, but you have a franchisee that is bearing the cost to, to roll out the program, and, and city taxpayers don't, don't pay anything. Right. Uh, also worth noting that that's uh, upwards of $500 million minimum, but it could be more. Right. Okay, yeah, sure, but I, I have a strong belief that nothing is free, you know. There's a cost. <laughs> this is as close as you can get, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, because uh, uh, in the future, you know, all these advertisements will modify our behavior, you know. You know? Mm -hmm. We'll buy more stuff, buy, buy less stuff, or do this or do that, you know. Right. So those are the costs for our constituents. Fair enough. Uh, so what are your most significant challenges to installing and activating the links according to the city targets? And how are you addressing them? Uh, so I, I'll speak to that briefly. I think that City Bridge will certainly speak to this as part of their testimony. I think um, one of the challenges has been uh, that sites where payphones are now turn out not to be viable, either because they don't meet a siting requirement. Um, to give one example, uh, the uh, structures uh, weigh a great deal more than phones. So if they're located over a vault, you could have a phone on there, but you can't have a, uh, a kiosk. So there was a site you would have had a replacement. Uh, I think one of the other challenges has been conduit uh, in terms of, you know, City Bridge is actually um, via a, uh, a contract uh, laying new fiber uh, for, for much of what it does. And in order to lay the fiber, you need a viable conduit. Um, I don't know, Anne, if you have further. There, there, there are a number of challenges. There is utility coordination um, is another issue that may not stand in the way of a link being ultimately installed, but it does take time. Every, every link has to be connected to power and it has to be connected to information via high-speed telecommunications fiber. Um, and that means that City Bridge can't do this alone. They need to depend on their fiber provider and the power provider, which in most cases is Con Ed, all working together. Okay, so, so can you tell us like, what's the average amount of time it takes to activate uh, a kiosk after they are installed? And what is the process for activation? So, Actually, the, the time frame between installation and activation is something that we are not entirely happy with and something that we are working with City Bridge to change. Uh, in fact, it's one of the items that's addressed in the proposed amendment to the Franchise and Concession Review Committee. There is quite a bit of work that has to be done between installation and activation um, because of these two connections in the manhole and that requires Con Ed actually coming to the site and the fiber provider coming to the site and doing this connection in the manhole followed by uh, smoke testing which is the final test of a unit and then turning on the unit. Under the proposed amendment that time frame would be limited to 45 days. 
If I could just add to that, um, you know, a lot of the time spent t to now, uh, Chair Ku has been on the rollout, sort of getting links out as much as we can. Um, I think um, with the arrival of a new Dewitt Commissioner just a few months ago, and there's actually a new Assistant Commissioner for Franchise who wasn't able to join us today, um, I think we're, we're turning our, we're not losing focus on going everywhere, but we're turning our focus to sort of the health of the program. And that, your question there goes to that. I Meaning if you have a link in the ground, but it's not activated, well, that's a disappointment to a person mm -hmm. on the street. They don't understand that. I just passed one actually last last night. So that's something we're focusing on. Um, and, and I think that, uh, as I mentioned, I think we're thinking more, it's not just about getting everywhere, but sort of making sure that they're activated quickly and worthwhile. Thank you, yeah. So as I mentioned in my opening statement, there is a p disproportional number of Ning NYC kiosks in Manhattan compared to the outer boroughs. Uh, even after the full rollout of the agreement, Manhattan will have over three times the number of kiosks as Queens. So how does Stewart envision the links between, uh, uh, the links being distributed geographically over the duration of the franchise? So t two answers, uh, Chair Chairman Ku, and actually both answers relate to the proposed amendment. Um, number one, the, the build-out schedule plan, which we, which we are requiring from City Bridge, is going to give us a real good sense to, that, to go to that very point. Um, number two, we've added a proposed change um, that will require that um, the, the number of uh, structures at the end of the day in every communi community district be the same or more um, when, in, you know, when the, if you have payphones in a community district now, you'll have the same number uh, of, of structures or more. So that's kind of like an equity uh, um, enforcement mechanism that is new and I think represents our interest in, in which we share um, with the council w with these links being ubiquitous and being everywhere. I think with that said, the, 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 the constraint in part um, is that the payphone footprint is hev heavily in Manhattan. And so in part, some of the, the number disparity you're seeing there relates to the fact that it is a, a payphone replacement program, but we really are focused on ec equity, uh, both we have been and, and as part of this proposal are focused on it as well. So can we have a, like a breakdown of the number of kiosks uh, by borough and by uh, city council districts? Um, the, the number of kiosks under the proposed amendment will be exactly the same per, per borough as in the original agreement. Uh, as Michael said, in addition to those, those borough targets, there will now be community district targets. And uh, after the hearing, we can share council district by council district breakdown of what's been installed so far um, and activated. We have that. So, uh, yeah. How, how many people? Uh, when will the other boroughs get their fair share of the things? You know? Because by by population, Manhattan has the least population. I mean, they may have more tourists. But the like, borough of uh, uh, Brooklyn Bo and Queens has more population. Right. Well, but as, we as have as the Michael least of Ling NYCs. You know? As Michael said, uh, this this was conceived as a payphone replacement program, and. Um, also, it was conceived as, as something that would serve heavily commercial districts as well as districts with a lot of foot traffic. Of course, most of the commercial districts in, uh, in New York City are concentrated in Manhattan. So by design, there are more structures slated for Manhattan. However, in commercial districts in other parts of the city, such as downtown Brooklyn, Long Island City, and downtown Flushing as well. Um, there will be significant numbers of Link NYC kiosks. Uh, downtown Flushing, I can say right now, has 30 replacements of public pay telephones in progress and eight new sites under review. Uh, we were recently at a Community Board 7 meeting presenting that. So the other boroughs will not be left out. Um, commercial districts, primarily are being served, and every district, will, every community district will be served in some way. So uh, when will downtown version have its first kiosk? Can you give me an estimate? I am going yeah, to I leave that, yet, no. I'm gonna leave that question to City Bridge uh, because the installation is directly in their hands, um, but definitely you can raise that with them. I know they're in progress. Um, and uh, which means that, that they're 
they're in the pipeline, they're coming. So uh, give me the answer. Uh, downtown Foshan is the second most busy uh, pedestrian district in the whole city. You know? And I'm surprised that we don't have any main MIC kiosks. So in an ideal world, we would make all the links appear all at once. They would spring up. But there are, are certain um, installation challenges that are connected with this. As I mentioned before, every kiosk needs to be connected to both electric power and more significantly, high-speed fiber optic cable. The high-speed fiber optic cable is being installed from scratch by CityBridge and its affiliates, and it needs to all connect to a hub. So when you look at the map of deployment, what's actually happening is things are starting from a central point and radiating ac outward. And that's what drives uh, that's what drives the deployment timeline, and the, the the pattern of deployment. Flushing, as I said, is 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 in the works, um, but it will take a while for these these branches to radiate out to every location. Uh, as Michael said, one of the things one of the most important things for us in this amendment is a full build out plan where we will be able to say I at any given time, well. That street is slated for this year, a pr pr particular year, so there will be more predictability. But it is a 10-year build-out. That's just how long it's going to take. If I, if I must, just, may just add, uh, Chair Koo, I mean, the picture you just made, this is something that sort of we think about on a daily basis, sort of where, where, would, we, where would a link be most valuable? And I think one other thing I wanted to point out about the amendment that we think will be good um, is that, again, the total number unchanged. But um, under the proposal we have, there are going to be more new locations. And what that means is we'll be less tethered to the payphone footprint and more able to look at maps and say, okay, no payphone here, but look at the map. Tons of foot, tons of foot traffic. It'd be a good place for a link. And that would be a chance for uh, council members and community board members to say, hey, why don't we do a link there? I think we're, we're really both open to, to feedback about I – mean, you all know your communities better than we do, and so hearing from you saying this is, makes sense is something we're and and's always open to that, as am I. Um, and so, but I, I think we we just completely share um, uh, that, and and I think that that's why we're also proud of the community district minimum requirement that would be in the amendment, so that we know that it, we're going to be in every community district the way we would have been um, had we followed the phone the phone fr footprint. Also, like when you. Um Every borough, right, you have a, a, a site plan, or every council district, you have a site plan to where you are going to install all the kiosks. Uh, will you be sharing uh, the data bef uh, with each council member before they install? Or, uh, because I, uh, this is the reason why. I mean, your site plan may be a few years old, right? Maybe, you know, or uh, demographics change. Like, like Flushing downtown has been being more, much more busy uh, now than a few years ago. Yeah, right. to answer so your question, Some Chair. original sites may not be ideal because of the traffic, the pedestrian traffic. So it's not good because if you want to install at a corner here, you will block the traffic of the pedestrian traffic, not the it vehicle traffic. So we need to, like, to communicate, yeah. So how does sit, uh, do it and City Bridge re evaluate this size to address the rapid population change? It's since it's, uh, since siting, yeah. It's actually a very good point. Uh, one, what the amendment requires is um, that City Bridge would put together, as I said, a year by year full build out mm -hmm. plan. But every year, well, first of all, that plan would call for corridors, not particular points because, as you said, conditions change. Every year we would take a, a fresh look at that and make any adjustments that are necessary. Um, and as, as, the, the, as time progresses, it's kind of you move from the big picture down to the detailed picture. So before any individual site is installed, City Bridge presents a detailed plan of that particular location and 
do it, reviews it to make sure that it complies with very detailed siting criteria that are designed to ensure the smooth flow of pedestrian traffic, to prevent obstruction of vehicular sight lines, and make sure that there are proper clearances from other types of, of street furniture and sidewalk installation. So we do a very careful review site by site. Every site must be approved by, by do it. Um, and that's, and we make sure that those, that the information that we have is up to date. So, 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 so you will share the data with all council members and council members can object to some sites, right? If you will take their, their input, say this is, uh, no, this site is no good because of, uh, it was near the school, but we don't want the school kids to hang around there too, too long, or because of too much pedestrian traffic. So you will take input from our local council members. Right? Definitely. We love to get input. Yes. Um, in, in relation to existing payphone sites, in order to keep this program moving, where there's an existing payphone, City Bridge can install it. Where there's a new site, we reach out and get input from council member and the community board and local business improvement district if there is one. The, the benefit of the build out program as well um, is that there's some thinking we can be doing about timing too. So for example, if we have a seven year plan, but you all know well, this is this is the most urgent spot. That's feedback. Would, that feedback would be vital for us to know. It, it's good to have a seven-year plan, but this year, this is where you should go. We would want to know that. Mm -hmm. And if you see a payphone and you think, "Oh, that's a terrible location for a link," let us know now. Definitely. Because every payphone is a potential link site. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, Councilmember Holden wants to ask you a question. Thank you, Mr. Pastor, for your testimony. It's a great, it, it sounds like a great program. Um, I, I think I have five in my district, 30 in Queens. We have um, two, I think, on the northern end of Queens Boulevard, and I think three on Jamaica Avenue. I don't know if they're all working, though, but um, it's a start, but I, it's a large district. There, and I wouldn't have, you know, they're on the southernmost and the northernmost part of my district. I'd rather have also in many of the, um, and I'm sure that we're going to get them eventually. Um, can, you, can you talk about, you know, obviously the, the council members can, can um, actually suggest areas. And um, now we're leaving that the footprint of the, of the telephones now. We're, we're not tethered to that, you said? No, not entirely tethered. Not entirely. Yeah, we're we're going to be less tethered to it. Okay. So um, could they be put in parks like, or Green Streets area? Where, uh, is, that, is that possible? So there are some there are some uh, restrictions as to where they can go, and they're they're right now I believe um, only permitted in commercial dis districts or overlays. So I think uh, I don't have a ready answer for you on parks, but I think right now the the way the program is structured, it's commercial district or overlays, and not not actually. Why is that? Is that just the original plan and, and commercial? It's not because it, certainly at bus stops um, where people or have some waiting time, that yep. would be nice, um, rather than just in a commercial district that's busy and then you yep. know, people are just gonna hook up. So I would think a waiting area. Yes, so um, totally yeah. share that um, share that uh, view, um, and I, I veered off into your, your question about parks, but bringing it back to bus shelters, I think we totally uh, share the belief that bus shelters are a great place to have links yeah. nearby, they're waiting, and, and why use your own cell data? You can use right. the free Wi-Fi to, to right. connect. And right. just to get information I'm just on gonna, a bus I'm just coming or that, not. <laughs> Yeah. Just, just to, um, under the existing siting criteria, bus stops are off limits, um, and under the uh, this amendment, links would be allowed towards the back of a bus stop, but there still would be sufficient clearance from a bus stop shelter to ensure that there wouldn't be conflict in the advertising and also that there's free flow and, of and, right. and close enough that you could step over, charge your phone, still see if the bus is coming in, close enough that you can see when the bus is coming in, and certainly close enough to use the Wi-Fi. Oh, that's good, okay. Um, what ab um, how are you addressing the privacy concerns that some people have in using the system? So uh, we addressed the, the, the privacy concerns um, via an, an, an amended privacy policy that we adopted over a year ago. We're extremely proud of this policy. Um, it has the imprimatur of the NYCLU, um, and it, it, we have a, a rigorous privacy policy in place, and um, that will be completely unchanged uh, by the amendment that we're taking to the FCRC. 
Okay, so I'd like to make some suggestions at, at some point, so if I can call your office, because we do have some areas that we'd like to get on the radar. Yes. Not, not wait till 2025, you know. We, we more than welcome that. Right. As I said, you, you know better than we do. Right. You know, to, right. to, to the corner level, right? We just don't know that. And you would. You'd say, right. this place happens to be very crowded. This place no one walks by, you know, and yes. And that includes, as, as, as Anne pointed out, um, pay phones, you know, because yes. pay phones are a potential. Because system. we do have fiber optics in Queens. We are, we are, I think we're catching up to the 21st century in Queens. <laughs> and we do need uh, services. And we, we're usually the last ones, actually, to get anything in, in the city. And so we, we feel like stepchildren sometimes in Queens. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So Eric's we're gonna, here. yeah, we're working well, on we priorities. Well, we do, we do, and it, it's proven over and over again. Thanks and so much. Yeah. Thank and you. we you. welcome input on All priorities. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, as long as they're not standalone. We can't do spot by spot because it has to all connect. Thank you. Yeah. So due to the, a lot of people want to testify, you know, all questions by our members, maybe limited to five minutes at the most. Okay. So next, uh, Council Member Lando. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, great to have you here. And I want to uh, thank Do It and Link uh, for the partnership both on getting the bus countdown information there. It was really, it's a, a great benefit, and I think other people will be excited as it rolls out across the city. And um, your both link and do its willingness to work with us on that really reflected a very good spirit of partnership, and, and I'm really grateful for it. And also in participatory budgeting, it was great to see Commissioner Saini out at the launch, and I voted on the on a link this year and uh, and found that. It was, it was wonderful to see it advertised. So I've become more of an enthusiast of the of the links over the over the recent months, which I guess is the the idea. I was gonna ask about bus stop shelter siting, so I'm glad to hear that the franchise agreement adjustments include changes that will allow siting nearer to bus stops because I, I really think that is something that it makes a lot of sense. I think we've got obligations under both franchises, but still this makes good sense. Um, so I guess two questions for you and then uh, hopefully can stick around for the questions for Link. One, um, in my mind, part of this is part of our broader effort to achieve broadband for all in New York City. I know City Hall is thinking about that. You guys are thinking about that. I wonder what we're learning from the challenges that have been faced in siting um, you know, a lot of us really beat up hard on uh, Fios for their inability to meet the obligations they had under their franchise agreement. Um, you know, clearly there's some things that are harder than we think. Um, what are we learning from the, this change that will help us do better at achieving broadband for all? How do the links fit in? Um, and what are we learning about like what's underground and what we need to do to drive forward to that, you know, to get closer? Yes, I, I'm, I'm glad you brought it up, Councilmember Lander. I mean, the, the, the broadband for all um, is a top level priority of the mayor, of Do It, of the commissioner. Um, and Link is definitely a part of that. It's only one part, but it's definitely a part of that. And, and I think the idea there is that we want everyone to have uh, equal access to high speed affordable broadband. Um, Link embodies that in some respects already. So if I, before I skip to the sort of what is learned, I mean, what you have now is 1,500 hotspots that weren't there before. Um, and people th that can use it, and that number is going to keep going up. Um, so I think that f our vantage point, from our vantage point, the broadband for all thing has been kind of in place since Link started, um, because that's that's what it, that's what it does. Um, uh, I think t to the question of, of what's been learned, I mean, it's a big city, and and we have lots of old infrastructure, right? And so I think that we uh, are thinking about that both from a Link perspective, but from from the broadband question more broadly. Um, what are we doing to ensure that once we decide place that are underserved, for example, that we can get fiber there. Um, and I think we at Do It are thinking a lot about the map, kind of what does the city look like, where, where is their broadband now, where is there not, and that's true for the office of the, of the CTO as well um, and, and, and City Hall. Um, and have so we learned something about that, you know, so far more than we need the two extra years? Have we started to learn where it is we should be focusing, if there are places where public investment is needed and appropriate in addition to the private investment funded you know, through the link agreement. In part, I, I don't know that the, I don't know the link program is what's teaching us that. It's just more thinking about it sort of all the time, obsessively. And um, I do think what the link program taught us uh, is that when you go out and you want to lay fiber, you may think you have conduit that that works and, and it doesn't. Um, I think that one of the premises was that you know a payphone site would be an easy you know easy thing, and that turned out to be not always always the case. Um, so I, I think. I think another thing I should say to what we learn, I mean, it's a it's a feedback mechanism, right? So when we're hearing from people like we really want to link, 
you can maybe presume that that means, well, they, they feel like they have a, a broadband need, you know? I mean, it's obviously only one thing, um, but I think hearing from council members, hearing from borough presidents about these are the places that are underserved, and you know, we're also working on the gigabit centers as well, and that's kind of a, a focus of ours. Is, you know, it's not just um, kiosks, but places where you can go to get that. Um, so I think there are, are a lot of lessons learned, but I think it's a, it's a good question to be thinking and about. All right, and I might ask Link some of this as well. You know, in, in, in this battle around these USIC, the contractor for identifying what's underground and some challenges that they had and how they were treating their workers, I think we've realized there's a lot, we, we know a lot less about what's underground uh, than we probably should, and obviously that got built out over a long history when there was a lot less open data, but um, I think that would be useful to kind of report to us uh, as you can. But uh, my other question for you guys is about how you're thinking about the time that the city has on the kiosks and using those in innovative and creative ways to engage people more. And I just, I wanna, I'm curious, you know, how you're tracking what works and what doesn't work. Like on the one hand, I, I love to go to community board meetings, so seeing the community board meetings up is, is good, but I'm not 100% sure that's what the vast majority of my constituents think is the most civically engaging. Not that it, you know, so how are you thinking about um, and tracking and paying attention to what's really innovative use of the time the city has in the public realm like this? Uh, what kind of campaigns get people to engage? What kind of engagement is meaningful? <coughs> and how to track that over time? So th if, if the commissioner was here, he would be sort of bounding out of his seat with excitement to answer this question. So I'll, I'll do my best to, to sort of channel him. But so he is very recently and repeatedly charged um, the, the DO-IT team to be thinking about just this question, you know, that it's, it's about much more than Wi-Fi, it's about information. And so he's, he's asking us to think. Um, for example, I, I, I talked already about the kind of, you know, time done, am I, end it, you're That's done. That's the end of my um, question time, but yes, not necessarily um, the end of your but, answer. But uh, yeah, and so, so basically I think that we, we are gonna take a deep dive on on the question of, of, of the use in a very local way. Um, yeah, so community board information, that could be very useful, um, but there are lots of other things that could be useful as well. I mean, the Aunt Bertha app is another example where people are going and they're finding out you know, where local uh, social services are. Um, so it's it's something that will be high on our radar to think about. Are we getting the most from from the app from the panel perspective? Uh, Council Member Yeager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to come to this from a from a different point of view. Uh, my colleagues have asked what they can do uh, to bring more and faster uh, kiosks into the district. I'm going to come to this from a different way. Uh, if a community wants to opt out or to say that a particular location is not uh, uh, in in the community's mind uh, uh, the best w the best use of uh, your great resource of its, these kiosks, can they do that? And, and specifically, I know you testified that uh, you, do no you do notice um, community boards and council members, borough presidents and bids with a 60-day comment period for kiosks that, re that do not replace pay phones, but I don't believe you notice uh, the communities if you're replacing a pay phone. Is that correct? Uh, that's right. So to answer your question, council member, uh, the, the question was, I, th I think, you know, can, can the community and the council members give feedback to say no? And the answer is yes. Um, and and it's diff there are different means of doing that. Um, we like to think that everyone loves a link no matter what, but it's true, there are different equities in play and some people don't, don't want the link. Um, so the, the, ways, the ways the community uh, could do that or the council could do that is twofold. One, if it's a new location, there's this formal process. And so you utilize that process, you've noticed of a, of a particular location. Um, but with respect to pay phones, I think Anne mentioned this already, um, if a council member were, uh, were to come and say, this particular pay phone, um, I, I, we, we want to raise an objection, right? I don't think we need a formal process to, to hear that objection and to think about it and to consider it. And I think we would. Um, I, I know we would, not I think, we would. So um, yes, if a community knows right now there's a pay phone on the corner of this street in our district and they come to you and they say, now of course it's always interesting with this because what's the community? The, some, some might love it and some might hate it and you sort of weigh, weigh, weigh that through. Um, but there's definitely an opportunity for you all to come uh, to us and say um, we don't want one. I, I should just going back to the change I described to the amendment. So um, there were gonna be 6,200 plus replacements of phones. That was kind of a part of the agreement. And that number is going down. So there's actually an increased opportunity now for the formal comment period as part of the green, uh, part of the new sentence. Okay. Um, 
uh, when I was on a community board before I came to the council earlier this year, we actually uh, voted formally to ask uh, do it not to do a kiosk in a particular location. Um, and I believe that that was not a payphone. That was a standalone kiosk that uh, was being contemplated. So we did do that. So there is a, uh, you know, the question of whether, how does the community opine? The community opines through its community board, which are duly appointed members, through its elected officials, uh, council members, other uh, legislators. Uh, the borough president obviously can opine, but you haven't indicated that it's in any way binding, that if you get a letter from a community board saying, don't do this here, do it, we'll say, sure enough, we won't do it here. Right. That, that is true, but I, I, I just have to stress that um, we are really uh, open and would take very seriously um, if, a, if a council member or a community board came member came to us and said that this site is bad, um, we would listen to that um, closely. Okay. And with respect to the, uh, the replacement kiosks, the kiosks that are to replace existing phones, so uh, you indicated that if the community or an elected official were to request do it not to do it at a particular payphone, it would be something that you would take very seriously. Um, but that's that's the kind of this, because there's no formal process of notification that is kind of leaves it up to the community or to the council members uh, to kind of drive around their district looking for payphones and saying yes here, no there, yes here, no there. Do you have a list of payphones uh, by council district that you can share with the members? Um, I, I just want to add that actually that pro that exactly what you're talking about was built into the process and at the very beginning of the franchise term we did in fact send lists to every single community board of payphones in in those districts and asked for feedback on you know whether there were comments on uh, whether they should or shouldn't be converted to links so so that we actually there actually was a formal process for that because of because all that information was known back in the beginning we, you know, we went through it once, but yes, we certainly can produce lists of, of existing payphone locations. How long ago was that done? Um, when you say at the beginning of the process, this, we're talking yes, about. Yes, I three believe years now. it was in early 2016, okay. so a couple of years ago. Okay, so before uh, before links started going in the ground. Okay, so if uh, it, at this point, uh, to the extent that it hasn't been done in particular places, and as Councilman Holden uh, indicated, you know, somebody out of boroughs. Wait, le we wait less for everything anyway, so. Uh, it, it was it, citywide. We know that, we <laughs> wait less, Manhattan gets everything first. Uh, it's, it's okay, we've gotten used to it, but uh, in the places where you haven't hit yet, can you share that information so that we can take a second look, particularly to those of us, like Councilman Holden and myself, mm -hmm. who are new. Uh, some, some of us may want to opine a, a new, and you know, in terms of Councilman Holden, he may want to say, well, move a little quicker, these are the places where I really want them. So, we come to this in different places, but we can help do it because we can target your resources and say, you know, this really needs it versus this really doesn't, yeah. and we can be helpful to you. Um, I should also point out that that we have we're doing extensive community outreach. Uh, do it and City Bridge together have been to, I, I think, in the 80s of community meetings in just in the last year and a half or so, and. Um, some of this, I think, I think you're right. There are locations, there are parts of the city where this program hasn't been yet. We'd love to come out and present to the community board or meet with the council member and just make sure the information is out there and so, so that people understand the program better and we can hear the concerns and, and have a dialogue. So we really welcome that. One last question, Mr. Chairman. I, I know my time is up. I just have one last question, very short. Um, I, I recognize and, and I do trust to it that uh, the open to suggestions taken very seriously are suggestions, recommendations, but at the end, they're suggestions, they're recommendations. What would it take for us to, you know, whether it's from a council member, from a community board, to give you recommendations that are binding? I mean, would you need legislation to do that, to a formalized process? How can we make sure that if a community board says, don't do it here, even though you're going to take it very seriously, but that you have to take it very seriously. You have to stop. Well, I think, uh, you know, and I wor I've worked with community boards for my entire career in city government, um, and community board recommendations are advisory. We take that advice seriously because this is a program that serves community, but that's, that's part of the nature of community boards. So we do take that advice seriously, and we really would be very happy to meet with, with um, we've met with community boards, community board committees, we've met with council members, council member staff, 
borough presidents and their staff, and we'd, we'd love to have a dialogue with, with anybody who, who's willing to sit down and talk to us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So um, let's talk uh, something about advertisement, right? Five percent of the advertise, uh, advertising reserved uh, for mayoral agencies. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. So what does that translate in terms of time on the screen? And are there, are there specific times that these advertisements run every, every so many or what? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, I said, what are the, since 5% of the advertising uh, revenue reserved for mayor, for mayor's uh, agencies. So, so um, can you tell us something about uh, how often these advertisements run on the big screen? No. Oh, oh. okay, so the, the advertising that's reserved for, for city use is um, managed by NYC and company, um, and it goes into the general rotation. City Bridge can explain to you better uh, how that works. When, when we say 5%, what that means is 5% of the time on all the, the links. Time. Yeah, all the links citywide. So NYC and company can actually um, work with the agency who's requesting it and pick particular uh, neighborhoods or particular links. Some things are, are of citywide interest, some things are of more local interest. So one of actually the really great things about this program and the advertising is that it can be targeted um, easily and can change on a dime, unlike old fashioned posters where somebody would have to go out and actually physically remove yeah. the thing and put it back in. This can be programmed from, from a central location. So, um, so that 5% of the time and how that translates to an individual message, it really depends on what, what the arrangement is with NYC and Co, between NYC and Co and City Bridge and where they want it targeted. Um, so, so does that mean 5% of the 24 hours every day that, it's, that, that it's will be reserved for, uh, for mayor's, uh, the agency's message? If you add it together, all the 24 hours on both sides of every link kiosk and took 25% of that total, I'm sorry, 5%, 5% of that total time, then yes, in 5% of that total time, now it might be concentrated in one location one month or in a different location the, the next month or week because this is, you know, it's, it's Constantly, so it's five percent of the total time. Five percent of the total, total not on the time individual on kiosks. No, so it's not exactly five percent of the kiosks, and it's not five percent of the time on one kiosk. It's five percent of all the time available on all the kiosks um, put together. Uh, a lot of the public service kinds of things you see out there, for instance, participatory voting and bus time, those are actually not part of those five percent. Those are uh, City Bridge voluntarily posting those messages because, and they can talk to this more. Um, they want people looking at the links. They they want to have useful messaging out there um, that is not only a public service, but it also is good for their advertising because uh, you don't tune out. You're looking there for something interesting. So um, yeah, participatory bu budgeting, bus time, weather, um, news updates, those are not part of the 5%. All right, yeah. So uh, can you tell us like, what type of data is collected from the link kiosk? And, and only what type is on the tablet? You know? And what about the sound and the visual data? Uh, so who has access to the, all these data collected from the, by the kiosk? You know? Okay, so I'll try to break that down a little bit, Chair Ku. I mean, all of this is, 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 is expressly laid out in the privacy policy, which is available on the Link NYC uh, website. Uh, it spells out the very limited uh, amount of personal information that is required. Uh, certain technical information from devices um, is collected and kept for a certain period um, before uh, it is left. 
Um, with respect to uh, cameras, um, the privacy policy is clear uh, that, that the use of that uh, is only for um, security, the security of the kiosks. Um, it is kept for uh, seven days and then all of it is destroyed. Um, uh, the um, environmental uh, sensor data as well is, is none of it is personalized collection whatsoever. Um, don't, I don't even really think any of the environmental sensor data is on at the, at the moment. Um, did I miss any of your litany? So, so uh, do other agencies have access to the data, or can they collect the data on their own data, their own data from the kiosk? No, no. So, uh, so who is collecting the data? Uh, the, the the all that the data is that are that is required to be collected, um, pursuant to the very strict privacy policy, is the franchisee uh, and the franchisee's partner intersection. So uh, we don't we want to avoid something like the Facebook uh, scandal, no. Yes. So, do we in the future we have something similar will happen? Yes. Well, we we I I completely agree, and I think that that's why we 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 beefed up the privacy policy so much for that very reason. Um, we, we the privacy policy speaks to the limits on collection, speaks to the limits on sharing, um, and so I think that we we were proud of the privacy policy because it's so stringent. Mm. So, what about uh, are these cameras and other equipment inside the kiosk? Are they used for uh, public good? Like monitoring uh, pedestrian traffic or other city planning purpose, like counting how many pedestrians pass at each point. Are we using those uh, for public good? Not at, not at this point. At this point right now, the cameras, there are two cameras on either side of the structure, and they are used solely for the purposes of, of security uh, of the kiosk as well. At the moment, they're not used for other thing. There, there is no collection of foot traffic via what is seen on those cameras or anything like that. It's very limited purpose right now. Oh, so it's nothing useful to for the agency to monitor at the moment. It's so for public safety, let's say. Yeah. Well, it could conceivably be of use for public safety, but right now it's it is a sort of very limited limited use. That's the that's the that's the decision we made with the privacy policy. So if if a, a user or a pedestrian they mark at the corner of the kiosk, can these cameras can be can the NYPD use the data from the camera? to locate or find out uh, who, who, who's the mugger? Yes, so the privacy policy provides that, that if uh, a law enforcement agency is authorized by law to get that data, they could request it, uh, they could get it, uh, and indeed I think that would I mean, that would make a lot of sense, honestly, yes. Um, so if, if there's a camera footage and a crime had been committed and the police department is investigated and go through lawful process to get that data to see what, what, what happened to the victim at that place, um, the data could be used for that. So that data is uh, safe only for seven days, you say, right? Correct. So right. after seven days, the normal left? Unless... Um, Can you retrieve it? Still retrieve um, it? No, it's after seven days, it's completely eliminated. But if if um, there's a request to hold on to it longer because of an incident, there is a way for the police department via the dealer to do that. The general rule is seven, but if there's been an incident and a request to hold on to data longer, um, they could do that. So these kiosks, and they advertise they have Wi-Fi access, right? Uh, what about, does it say anything about uh, Bluetooth beacons uh, being installed? Yes, yeah, so, the, so the privacy policy doesn't speak to beacons um, because the beacons that are on the, the links do not collect any information whatsoever from any device. Um, what the beacon technology is, is that the beacons just emit one way to devices um, and do not collect anything whatsoever unless uh, a person has an app and has expressly consented to want to receive notifications via the beacon um, and only in that instance. But that's the reason that the privacy policy doesn't speak to the beacons because the beacons do not collect. They're just ping, ping, ping. So, so, what, what, so, so how does this privacy policy work? I mean, people, when you use the machine, uh, the, uh, you will ask the user to say okay or I agree all these terms or what? Yeah, the way the privacy policy works is that the franchise agreement gives do it the authority to require privacy protections as part of it. So stepping back from the user experience, do it has the power to say privacy is important to us and to require the things and, and that's what we did. And then yes, the, 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 the user sees that privacy policy when they, when they, or can see it when they link up. And, and this privacy policy, uh, you, you had to ask the user every time or they just ask one time? And the next time you use the kiosk, they don't ask you again. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm sorry. 
if the you said, you said like that, uh, uh, you put the permission to to use this data, right? So you see, oh, they only ask you one time. You you talking about beacons or you yeah, talking the, about the beacon and, and the Wi-Fi and all this data co collections. So it's separate. The the beacons. Beacons are used, my understanding is beacons are used by particular apps, and so you give permission to the app to, to, to get whatever kind of data. You know those little pop-up screens come up and they say, can we access your location data and your camera data and whatever, and I say no. But if you say yes, then, then the beacon can communicate out to you, but you can't communicate back to the app via the beacon. Wi-Fi is different. Um, it's just a different technology. And the Wi-Fi data, yes, you put in, well, you sign in by putting in an email address once, and that is subject to the privacy policy. I, I so think to answer the Wi-Fi is only one time. Then you, you type in your email, and you say, OK, then, then every time you don't have to repeat the process. You don't have to keep signing in again. You sign in one time, and and you're a subscriber. And every time you're you're within range of a link and the Wi-Fi, you're automatically connected. Um, all of that because it's automatic. Well, not because, but it, it's automatic, and all of that is covered by the privacy policy. The beacons, as Michael said, are not part of the privacy policy because the beacons don't collect anything. Nothing so for so you. for beacons, you know, say my phone, I have Bluetooth, right? If I walk past a, a, a link, a kiosk, you will, the advertisement will come out here? No. No. no, only if you've downloaded a particular app that as part of that app, you have consented to beacon information hitting you. But just, just your phone, if you've not done that and you just have your phone on Bluetooth, then the beacons would just ping off your phone and there'd be no... no yeah, I suppose my Bluetooth is on all the time. Right, but there's no Bluetooth. There's no Bluetooth connectivity between a phone uh, and a link. It's only if you've if you expressly consented to have the beacon transmittal uh, hit your phone. Um, but yeah, if you have Bluetooth on right now, but you have not consented to have beacon data uh, transmitted to you, then it wouldn't. I, I should also add that that CityBridge CityBridge's representatives who are here are are really experts in the technology and what does what. Um, and so you can, you can pick this up again with them. But as far as the privacy policy goes, it applies to the Wi-Fi, but it does not apply, and the cameras, but it does not apply to the beacons because the beacons aren't collecting anything. Okay. So uh, let me go to this. So, uh, can you like uh, provide like clarification how the local business or local nonprofits uh, can uh, will be able to advertise on these kiosks? And then I is there a fee or charge for say a community board want to do an advertisement? Uh, there are vacancy or, or BID uh, the business management want to want uh, some special uh, promotions for the local merchants. Uh, so how does this work? It, it's a great question. Uh, our franchisee, City Bridge, initiated a program called Link Local, um, and that allows a business that's close to a link to get free advertising space on that link. Um, and you can talk to City Bridge more about that, but it's very popular. We've had uh, a lot of local merchants using it. Uh, also, another, another benefit for local businesses is um, that if you're in range, there's free Wi-Fi in, in your place of business, in your store or in your restaurant. Uh, we've seen incidents of businesses actually advertising this. Um, I personally, I use this even before I, I worked at Do It. I wanted to work on Wi-Fi uh, with, with a colleague, and I called the restaurant and I said, do you have Wi-Fi? They said, no, but we have a link right outside. So this really is something that, mm. that benefits local businesses? No, I'm, I'm talking about like real advertisements from lo like, say a local bakery wants to do an advertisement, right? And uh, how much time is allowed? Like, the, ma ma the mayor agents, they have 5% of time, time. Right? So how much time is dedicated to local uh, merchants 
for, for pro bono use for the public. Okay. How much time is that? It's, it's, it's on request, and it's via this program called Link Local. I don't know what the percentage is we can get back to you on on how much time has been used is it for 5% Link Local. Or? Uh, it, it's, it's, not, it's not set aside like that. It's on request, but we can find out how much has actually been used for that purpose. Okay, let me go to another uh, question. Say. Like the proposed amendment will allow for kiosks to be situated like within 50 feet of a bus zone. So can you define a bus zone? So uh, under how, how the, wide is this bus zone? Under the existing agreement, anything that's in a bus stop it cannot ha a bus stop can't have a link. So a bus stop starts where you see the sign. Yeah. And it ends either at the crosswalk or at the next um, parking regulation sign. And under the existing siting criteria in the, in the existing franchise agreement, there are no links in, in that zone. You could call it a zone, call it a bus stop. Um, one of the proposed amendments would allow a link to be in that zone, but not in the first 50 feet. So bus stops usually, are maybe around 80 feet to 100 feet long. Some of them are even longer. They could be up to 120, 150. The first 50 feet are reserved because uh, there, it, there needs to be free passage of, of um, people getting on and off the bus, particularly wheelchair passengers. And the wheelchair accessible entrance to the bus is generally in the front. So you really want to keep that area clear. But starting at 50 feet back under the amendment, you could have a link. Because we, we've heard a lot from people <coughs> that they want to be able to use links in bus stops. It's kind of compatible. You're waiting for the bus, gives you something to do, check, check 311, enter a complaint, um, check the weather, yeah, check yeah. a map. So that, does this include the bus shelters? Uh, they already have advertisements on them. Some bus stores, they have nice advertisements. They're blinking. It just almost looks like a, a link uh, uh, NYC advertisement. So it would be a duplication of too many advertisements in the same day, place. S uh, so, yeah, two things. First of all, the, the links will be only starting 50 feet away from the top. 50 of feet away. 50 feet away from the bus stop sign. And second, even if the bus stop shelter is further back in the stop, there's still a 15-foot clearance requirement between the bus stop shelter and the link, which is the same as the clearance requirement between a newsstand and a link. So as far as the, the original don't allow them in a bus stop had more to do with passengers loading and unloading. Um, the, the distance between a link and another advertising structure is unchanged under the amendment. It was 15 feet before and it's 15 feet going forward. We're not changing that. Same for newsstand, same for bus stop shelter. So, so uh, uh, in, in, in line of that, so what progress has the city and city bridge made in fulfilling the terms of its January, uh, January 2017 settlement agreement with the National Federation of the Blind? Because you, 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 we have too many things there. The, the, the people with uh, impaired uh, seeing, they have a difficulty navigating uh, around the bus stop. Because uh, now SBS, they have special kiosk for selling the tickets too. You know, they, so the whole bus stop over there is very cluttered. So people have a difficulty to see. We, oh, wow. oh. Yeah, we work very closely with DOT on coordination. Um, I worked for DOT for many years. And and uh, we are we're in constant contact with our sister agency about about siting and placement. Uh, we certainly have no no desire to interfere with SBS um, or with the the SBS wayfinders and the ticketing machines. And we will make sure that those clearances are are factored into every siting decision. Again, do it reviews every single site. Um, and, uh, and we make sure, and we have very detailed citing criteria, we make sure that, that those are met. So have you made any agreement with the, or a settlement with the National Federation of, uh, of the Blind? 
Yes, that lawsuit was resolved. It was a little bit before my time. My understanding is that the kiosks themselves were modified to, uh, to accommodate blind people. I believe it had to do with the 911 call button. And, and when you push the 911 call button, there is now an, an audio message that tells you what to do. Um, so that, that lawsuit is completely resolved. All right, so, so who chooses the advertising uh, contents on the kiosk? And uh, what is the process? Uh, I mean, anyone can advertise, or is there some restrictions that they, they cannot advertise a political uh, 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 related items or what? Or uh, the, advertising, the advertising is in City Bridge's hands. Um, their goal is to, to take in enough revenue to fully fund this program, again, at no cost to the users or the taxpayers and generating significant revenue for the city. There are certain restrictions on uh, tobacco advertising and alcohol advertising um, in relation to tobacco and even e-cigarettes. That's not permitted on links. Alcohol advertising has to be at least 200 feet from certain, um, certain other things like uh, schools and houses of worship um, and uh, obscene or offensive advertising in violation of, of state penal law is also not permitted. Okay, so um, another question I have is, is uh, like, are the kiosks already, they, they are all capable to take bus information uh, to on, in the machines? Because uh, uh, th this is a very good feature. It's coming very soon. It well, started only, only in Pasto that they have it now. It started as a pilot in in Brooklyn just to make sure everything was working properly. Um, to date, as far as I know, there haven't been any technical problems, and so it will be rolled out. It will be primarily on uh, links that are near bus routes. Um, so if and I don't know if there are any such links. If there are links in locations where there are no buses nearby, then bus time isn't gonna run there. But generally speaking, anything that's close to a bus stop will have bus time. So only on the, on the, on, the uh, on bus routes? Close to bus routes. Yeah, close to the bus right. routes, you have the uh, bus information. Right. Uh, and it's not there yet, but it will be quite soon. But you, you will be there, right, in soon. But right now, it's only in past low you have it. Right. But it's a matter of weeks, not months, before this is rolled out. So what about, uh, uh, the, you, can we incorporate the, the wayfinder in the kiosk too? Because right now, the, the New York City has a lot of wayfinder uh, in, in a lot of papers. I think it's becoming obsolete, you know, because it's such bulky thing. It's, it's, it's just, just a map, you know, but it's very bulky. And it's an interesting in the, in the kiosk, uh, it's much better. You save public space. It's an interesting idea, something you might want to bring up with DOT. Mm. So, so I have to bring up to the DOT for them to incorporate to, into, into the kiosk, right? Yeah, the Wayfinders are their program, so I, I can't really speak to that. Sir Coop, if I could just give a quick update on your prior question. Uh, I, I think the information we have is that as of this morning, the bus, the bus route information is now citywide live. It's now okay. everywhere. <laughs> I'm happy because I use it all the time. <laughs> so, yeah, so we're gonna wrap up. Uh, uh, the, so my last question will be like, in 2016, uh, Telebean Communications sued the city over its franchise with City Bridge, arguing that avoiding Link NYC with the sole contract to replace the public payphones violated federal law. So what is the status of this uh, lawsuit? Uh, that, that case was settled uh, prior to my time and prior to Anne's time as well, but that was resolved. Uh, it's already okay, settled? Sorry. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's resolved. City Bridge now owns all the public pay telephone. Thank you. So, thank you for spending time with us. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you to your colleagues. Yeah. And we have uh, 
Julian Baker, no, no, Julian Baha, Julian Baha from Link NYC, and Jan Hensley from Link NYC, and Ruth uh, Fastel. Fastel from Link <laughs> NYC. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's all good. <laughs> so uh, you may start after identifying yourselves. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, I'm Jennifer Hensley, uh, the president of Link. For Intersection, the managing member of CityBridge, the company responsible for delivering the Link NYC program under a franchise um, agreement with Do It. And I'm delighted for the opportunity to update you on the progress of our program. When I appeared before this council approximately 18 months ago, Link was still something of a newcomer on the city's streets. In my previous testimony, I explained how we were repl replacing the city's obsolete payphones with beautiful state-of-the-art kiosks that would provide free phone calls and the fastest public Wi-Fi available, as well, as well as other valuable public amenities, all at no cost to taxpayers. I described some of the challenges that we have faced while implementing this first-of-its-kind program in New York City's notoriously complicated roadbeds and sidewalks. Notwithstanding those challenges, at that time we had 500 kiosks ins installed with 800,000 unique users signed up for Wi-Fi, 40,000 phone calls per week, and a demonstrated annual positive economic impact of $72 million. Today, a short year and a half later, we have over 1,500 kiosks activated across the five boroughs with more than 3.7 million unique users signed up for Wi-Fi. We are now providing over 250,000 free phone calls per month, and in 2017, we made $26 million in payments to the City of New York and saw an annual, uh, annual economic output from our program of $161 million. Lincoln YC has become a beloved part of the New York City streetscape, providing fast, reliable, free Wi-Fi to millions of New Yorkers and visitors. We regularly meet with community boards, civic groups, bids, and the like to ensure that our services are understood and accessed by New Yorkers and visitors alike. Our tablets have become bona fide community resource centers, providing one-touch access to important services and information such as lo local community boards website, MTA information, and 311. The city's 311 app alone sees over 1,300 opens per week, and we recently started offering community boards the opportunity to advertise their full board meetings for free on our 55-inch screens in, in each district. We've done this for 87 community board meetings and counting. Since we were last here, we've partnered with a group called Aunt Bertha to add a tablet app that makes it easier for New, York's to connect to so New Yorkers to connect to social service organizations, whether they are in need of assistance or seeking a place to donate or volunteer. Since we started this partnership over a year ago, 115,000 users have taken over 300,000 actions to search and reach out for much needed resources. As part of our advertising program, we created Link Local, a unique offering that allows small businesses to advertise on our kiosks at no cost, and have worked with over 200 small businesses in all five boroughs on the program thus far. We've created window stickers for businesses whose customers can e easily access the Wi-Fi from adjacent kiosks, and partnered with community organizations to provide free training on how to use Link. We've also had some fun facilitating over 12,000 free phone calls to Santa around Christmas time and inviting New Yorkers to share their marriage proposals on Link at Valentine's Day. We saw five successful proposals this year and no unsuccessful ones. We haven't stopped either. Um, just last week we came together with you, you and with Councilman Lander and the rest of the City Council to offer voting for participatory budgeting on our link tablets in an effort to truly bring democracy to the streets of New York. The participating, par participatory budgeting app was opened over 5,000 times that week. And we've also started displaying real-time emergency messages with the Office of Emergency Management alerting New Yorkers to severe weather alerts and school closings. With you, we launched subway transit updates, which have been greatly appreciated by everyone. Um, who are now informed about the train delays before going down into the subway system. Our real-time bus updates um, went live across the five boroughs this morning, as you just heard, and now New Yorkers waiting for a bus can save money, enjoy super-fast Wi-Fi for free, and know how long they have to wait for their next bus to arrive. 
All of these initiatives have come from valuable feedback from our users and stakeholders who have taken to social media and the press to commend Link NYC for our responsiveness and partnership. In fact, we have dedicated staff that cultivates these partnership and responds with editorial content and user experience improvements that help solidify our connections to the diverse communities we serve. In a recent third party survey, 93% of New Yorkers said they believe that Link NYC is a positive initiative for New York City, an astounding and impressive rating nearly three years into our program and consistent with our findings from each of the surveys we conducted regularly since we launched our service. We look forward to continuing our partnership with the city to expand Link's reach and impact in all five boroughs. There's more work to be done for sure and there are still challenges facing our great program, including some of the same implementation challenges we discussed at length before this committee in 2016. The city's sidewalks are crowded and competition for space is fierce, as you pointed out. A large percentage of the old payphone sites have failed the link siting criteria, forcing us to search for new sites and engineer new connections, adding time and cost to our deployment plans. In addition, much of the city's underground infrastructure suffers from deferred maintenance and coordinating with the major utilities and public agencies requires time and substantial investment. We have been working with DOIT to propose limited fr franchise contract amendments to address some of the specific siting and commercial issues that we've encountered and ensure the continued success of Link NYC. We'll be appearing before the Franchise Concession Review Committee next month seeking approval of those adjustments to siting and inf infrastructure support, leaving the key elements of the LINK program intact, the total number of 7,500 units to be deployed and the minimum revenue guaranteed to the city under the contract will stay exactly the same. The requirement for distribution of kiosks throughout the boroughs will be strengthened with additional requirements to deliver LINKs equitably among community districts throughout the city. We're also excited that the amendment will give us the confidence in our route planning to be able to create a full build plan in addition to the yearly rollout plans we provide. This will help the city and our users better know when to expect links and where. CityBridge is also making significant investments in ensuring our system remains state of the art. We are constantly working on improvements to the security and reliability of the connection to the link network and are working closely in, in close partnership with DOIT and the New York City Cyber Command, and we're excited to implement Cyber Command approved DNS protection for link, net, for link users on our network. We expect to announce more details on these service upgrades in the coming weeks, and we'll continue to ensure that Link remains state of the art and our users have access to the very best technology. We are very proud of the tremendous success of our project and the significant positive impact we're having on our city. Transformational new technology is definitely not easy, but we continue to make significant investments in the program and work closely with DOIT, community boards, the council, our users, and other stakeholders to ensure that LINK remains a valuable and beloved public service. I welcome any questions. Thank you, yeah. So my, my question is, what is the average time uh, it takes to activate the kiosks after they are installed? Yeah, on Why, average. Uh, what is the process of activation? Sure. Um, on average, across our network, it takes approximately 45 days to activate a kiosk. Once we install it with our civil contractors, mm -hmm. we need Con Edison to come out and power the unit on. We also need our fiber um, partners to make the connection to the backbone of fiber. And we need our internal staff to go out and test the unit and ensure it's fit for public use. It takes about 45 days on average across the fleet to um, address these issues. In some cases, due to infrastructure challenges, either with the power connection or the fiber, it can take much longer. So we work in close coordination with our partners to ensure we can do it as expeditiously as possible. And as Duet mentioned, as part of the amendment we have before the FCRC, we will be uh, beholden to a 45-day turnaround in that process. Okay. so. Well, when do you expect the fashion uh, to be to have its first kiosk? 
in Flushing. Yeah. As was previously mentioned, we're in um, discussions with, uh, with your community on greenfield siting locations now. We're working with fiber providers to understand um, how quickly we can get the fiber connections that we need out to your neighborhood. So we don't have a definitive timeline today, but are working aggressively to be able to provide that to you. So what, a month or six months or a year? Several months at minimum. Um, Several months? Yeah. Because uh, we, we want this to be installed as soon as possible. Yeah. Understood. We've yeah. heard that feedback from you and your office and definitely take it extremely seriously. Um, we are working with our fiber providers to assess how quickly we can get the fiber connection out there, um, as well as moving through the greenfield siting process mm -hmm. with your community. Um, so we're happy to um, figure out how we can expedite that for sure. So like, what languages are on the kiosk? Like, because I asked because if you work on downtown flushing, the eighty percent of the projections are Asian, you know, yeah, or more, you know. So uh, it would be nice, like, uh, if you have a machine that is, uh, like, language sensitive, because a lot of pedestrians, a lot of tourists, they don't speak English, they don't, yeah. they don't read English. So if you like, put in Chinese or Korean or other languages. Thank you, Council Member. Yeah. We have multiple languages on the 55-inch screens to teach people that they can join this Wi-Fi for free. Um, we have this in English, Spanish, French, Creole, Chinese, and Bengali currently. As we roll out to other neighborhoods that have high density of certain populations, we're happy to expand on that. We work with um, the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs to create that. And then on the actual tablet, we try to use minimal languages and a lot of icons to explain what you can do at each key, at each tile. So it'll say phone calls with an image of a phone so that you know that that does phone calling. When you open the maps, Google Maps offers dozens of languages that all are available on the tablet. So does Aunt Bertha. Um, so, and yeah, so, and you know, 311 offers dozens of languages as well. So we have a multi-language uh, kiosk for sure. Yeah, because this is important because uh, a lot of council districts are, uh, like, what do you say, they, they mostly certain type of uh, population living, right? Like in uh, Queens, uh, uh, in Flushing, we have Asian mm -hmm. Americans in in, um, in Brooklyn, we have a certain area, a lot of Russians, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in Sunset Park or Chinese or uh, mm -hmm. so everywhere is the population is different. The demographic is different, so it will be nice if you you adjust the language. Like, say, hey, this area is like ninety percent, eighty percent Asian. Mm -hmm. uh, you, if you put uh, like French there, then it's not, not that much use. We do we do that. We work with s data that's available online from the census data to other data that the city has, as well as working with the Office of Immigrant Affairs to confirm that we're playing the language that might be needed most in certain areas at a higher percentage. And then this message has to be real clear on the first page. I don't want it at the, only at the corner. Like, what is, is there a point, uh, touch this to have Chinese because most people, they, they don't. It should be on the main screen and people can see right away that if you don't speak any, use English, just touch yeah. this for Chinese, touch this for Korean. Or Absolutely, English. no, that's, that's great feedback. Yeah. So, so one of the, the ideas uh, uh, well, we talked about was uh, using the kiosk as, uh, to do participating budgeting. So what is done with the data uh, that is collected and, and how is this shared? So you share with for who? Sure, so we worked with uh, Do It and the City Council as well as the company that was building the participatory budgeting website to get this on our links. We had voting on the links for all, all the whole week of participatory budgeting and 5,000 people have up, oh, chose to open that tile on the link kiosks. All of the data collection happens from the participatory budgeting website. So we didn't collect any data, we were just providing a portal for people to have another way to vote. So do you have a feature that prevents people from the voting multiple times. Uh, because some, some budgeting, they care yeah. about such a, such a project. 
They so send people yeah. to go there. No. <laughs> yeah. they, they vote like, oh, well, let's do it 10 times, no? Yeah. <laughs> so that was all participatory budgeting. They've, you know, as you know, they've done this many years and they've worked hard to do that. So again, we just provided a platform for them to be, but I voted on a link kiosk and I know that you had to give your phone number and get sent a code to confirm you haven't voted before. So that's how they choose to do that. So, so they, you had to put in a code and uh, your phone number? Yep, and that would be the same on a website if you, or on our kiosk. It was all. So part of that wha process. what happened if they put in a fake number, telephone number? So this is all actually the participatory budgeting's technology. So it was available on the on the link tablets, but it was managed by the participatory budgeting website and vendor. So they will take care of the the duplication. Exactly. Yeah. So so uh, what what what. What, what equipment is installed in the Link, Link NYC's kiosk? So other than the, the, we know the cameras, the Bluetooth beacons, and your microphone in there, right? Well, there's a speaker and a microphone that operates the, the phone calling feature on the tablet. Um, the tablet is an Android tablet, similar to what's publicly available to any consumer. Um, we have four computers that are running. Um, there's an ad, two ad screen computers, um, as well as a tablet computer and a maintenance computer. Um, and in 40 units, we have environmental sensors collecting air quality information um, in a partnership with Argonne National mm. Labs. So, so is there any uh, difference between the kiosk uh, in different areas? They all have the same equipment? Correct. Uh, so uh, I would suggest that you, say, like you said before, you can use the collect, uh, uh, environmental data, right, the air quality. Uh, what about for like public safety? Uh, you, you, since you have the camera up there already, you might as well uh, do a 24 hour recording of the whole street. Something happened, NYPD can come to you and say, you know, there's sure. a crime uh, at this, uh, this area. Uh, has, has that happened? Uh, you, NYPD come to you for data? For yeah. digital data to, 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 to look for the uh, perpetrators. Sure. Um, we are, you know, we we receive subpoenas or other law enforcement requests. Um, if they're deemed to be valid and we have available information, we're able to respond and pr make that available. Um, I, we publish a transparency report every year. Um, I believe we had eight inquiries um, for our information and provided it twice. So that, is there an incidence that is NYPD actually use the data and, and solve a crime or something like that? We don't know if they solved the crime, but our information was made available to their investigators or to their, um, to their agents. I think this will be a quick help you know, to our public safety system. You know? Because I believe in other cities, they have like cameras, they can monitor all the streets, and, and they can like, catch a perpetrator right, uh, like, really soon after they're happening, because they know yeah. where they are. You know? So since you have uh, cameras everywhere, soon, right? Yeah, there, yeah, there are cameras um, in every single link. Only a handful of them are, are currently activated, again, because they're used for um, monitoring of the link itself for vandalism. Are, are they on the top of the, the kiosk? Above the 55-inch display, yeah. Uh, so uh, you also take a picture of the users, too? No. No? We don't take it. I mean, we don't take any pictures. We don't um, monitor the the camera footage. It's stored for seven days in the event that there's an incident with one of our kiosks or that we get a request from law enforcement for it. We're able to retrieve that information. So, uh, can you like provide clarifications on how local businesses can uh, advertise on these kiosks? Or sure. is there a fee? Uh, and, and who qualify for this uh, this uh, uh, low charge uh, uh, advertising? Sure. So there is no fee. Uh, the program is called Link Local. It is very easy. We have a simple Google form that any small business um, can fill out, and then we will create creative using our um, our marketing team. Send it to them for review. If they like it, then we will get it up on the two links, four screens closest to their business, and it will play for one month, and then if they want another one, they can do another one. And it's all for free. 
So is play on the two screens, the big screens? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep, on two different links, four screens. And also on the tablet too? No. The tablet is is different. Yeah, the tablet oh. uh, just has social services and and the other things, but. And also, in addition to the Link Local program that Ruth described, which is really something we um, offer to you, to um, small businesses as we roll out into communities, we also have a small and medium-sized business selling team um, as part of our overall ad sales platform. And so businesses that do have advertising budgets that want to put um, ads on links and maybe want to be in a more broad distribution mm -hmm. beyond uh, the two links in front of their store, they can reach out to our sales team team um, and purchase an ad advertising package through our normal sales channel. So, but uh, uh, is it really expensive if they... It's not. Um, it's we sell, um, you know, all kinds of packages for all kinds of, of businesses, and um, because it's digital advertising, because we're able to, um, to, you know, target individual screens or locations that are most valuable to that business, we're able to put together packages that are actually very reasonably priced. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Just yeah, thank you for coming. So we have more people to talk. All set. Yeah, right. Thank you. Next, uh, we have um, Ta 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 Tari Santa Sanderson, yeah, yeah. Sanderson from T NYC, and An Angela Pinsky from uh, ABMY, and Noel Hodago from Beta NYC. Thank you for coming. Please identify yourself and you can begin. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Talene Sanisarian. I'm the policy director for Tech NYC. Tech NYC is honored to have this opportunity to support the Link NYC program. We are a nonprofit trade group with the mission of supporting the technology industry in New York. Through increased engagement between our more than 600 members, New York government, and the community at large. Our ultimate goal in engaging in this dialogue is to demonstrate that New York is the best place for technology companies to grow and develop. We believe that New York's unique business ecosystem as a global center for so many industries such as finance, media, fashion, art, and real estate will serve to strengthen the technology businesses that call New York home. And that in turn, technology will further strengthen those incumbent industries. With that in mind, we are proud to support Link NYC, a first of its kind program that gives New Yorkers access to ultra fast public Wi Fi while also connecting users to a host of other services, including calling anywhere in the US, accessing maps and city services, or charging their cell phones. From the perspective of our, of our organization, addressing the digital divide is of paramount importance. As a greater part of our lives revolve around internet access, the value of available Wi-Fi wi grows. This is especially true for children as more tools for learning and growth are found through digital means. For this reason, our organization and several of our members have been frontline supporters of the city's CS for All initiative, a program that aims to bring computer science education to every school in New York City in the next decade. We believe technology education will only grow in importance in the future economy, and it is therefore essential to provide this type of education for the children of New York City. Also beyond the fast free Wi-Fi, Link NYC provides useful services such as free phone calls, maps, and access to New York City services with the purpose of establishing a more equitable and connected city. Offering New Yorkers the opportunity to tap into Aunt Bertha, the Aunt Bertha database or the 311 app to find food pantries, emergency housing, health care, and other city services ensures New Yorkers connect with resources they need when and where they need them. In addition to these very worthwhile local benefits, Link NYC also increases New York's profile as the city that embraces technology and solidifies its place as one of the primary tech hubs in the United States. From the perspective of Tech NYC, this is no small feat. Jobs and technology are vitally important for New York's continued economic health. Recent statistics show that the average annual salary for New York City-based workers in the technology industry was 147,300 compared to citywide, the citywide average 
of 89,100 for all private sector positions. In New York City, employment in the technology industry after the Great Recession grew at four times the rate of the rest of the economy, and overall employment in New York technology industry jobs increased 71 percent from between 2004 and 2014. Since 2010, salaries in the tech sector increased by 29 percent, more than three times faster than in the rest of the private sector. We cannot emphasize the point enough. When technology companies decide where to set up shop, programs like Link NYC matter because they demonstrate that New York City takes technology seriously and will be a partner to the industry. Thank you to the city and Link NYC for bringing this first of its kind project to New York City. We are excited to see what's next for this unique digital platform. Thank you. Next, yeah. Hi, I'm Angela Pinsky, um, Executive Director of the Association for a Better New York. Thank you, Chair Ku, for the opportunity to testify today. The Association for a Better New York is a 46-year-old civic organization that promotes effective co cooperation of public and private sectors to improve the quality of life for all New Yorkers. We are pleased at the opportunity to express our support for the Link NYC kiosks and to encourage the Council and the Administration to continue to work with Intersection on the successful implementation of this technology and citywide infrastructure that broadens free Internet access to New Yorkers, narrows the digital divide, provides critical connections to emergency services and modernizes our streets and rationalizes our street furniture to better match the needs of today's New York. Since 2016, we have seen the replacement of underutilized and undermaintained payphones with the Link NYC kiosks, which have shown a dramatic increase in usability and value. The dynamic display has allowed for increased advertising, public service annou announcements, informative displays, and items of interest, which contribute to a more interesting New York streetscape. Initiatives such as showing the content from the Winter Olympics was creative and innovative and were not possible prior to the installation. Additionally, we are now at the point where an individual's reliance on the personal phone is so critical that the provision of a power source to someone who's about to have a phone battery die, and this happened to me, um, feels like the provision of an emergency service, so much so that it has become practically a necessity for anybody, for any new indoor public space and a prized amenity to outdoor spaces. The free high-speed the free high-speed public Wi-Fi, as well as the useful services on the accessible tablet, including free phone calls, maps, and access to city services, makes New York a more inviting city to residents, employees, and visitors. From the early days of implementation, Intersection has been responsive to concerns and reports raised by businesses, and we are pleased at the partnership the installation of Link NYC kiosks have created with employers. Thank you again for the opportunity to support this beneficial infrastructure, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Well, and to the Sergeant in Arms, I have my testimony up here to distribute. Um, so, Beta NYC has been thank uh, has been fully supporting Mayor Bloomberg's and Mayor De Blasio's reinvention of the municipal payphone, uh, and we're excited to see how the Link NYC has transformed the urban landscape and helped bridge the digital divide. And five years into this deployment, um, we have a few observations and concerns. Um, the observations are obviously this is bridging the digital divide and providing public internet access. Um, Advertising has helped fuel or fund public housing connectivity, which is a great thing. Uh, links have become dynamic billboards of community information. Wanted to echo the fact that com advertising for community board meetings um, has been great to see. Uh, it's also been wonderful to see uh, advertising for participatory budgeting and that constituents could vote through the kiosks. Uh, it was awesome to see that uh, bus time has now been added on top of subway service. Um, and it's been interesting over the winter to see uh, alternate side parking disclosures as well as school closures go up on the Link NYC. So f fundamentally, as devices that provide public information, they're wonderful to see in the streetscape as urban furniture. Um, uh, a little side story about how Link NYC has helped change and uh, force community boards to adopt 21st century tools. Uh, when Intersection and the City Bridge team went out and started saying we want to put community board websites on the link devices, um, a majority of the community board websites are not mobile compliant. So when they, and you can still go to many of the Link NYC devices, and you'll get a, uh, a non-mobile friendly community board website. And it's uh, been a, uh, an opportunity to work with Do It and to work with different community boards as well as borough presidents to help move community board websites into the 21st century. And it's wonderful to have the Link NYC device as kind of a forcing factor on that. 
Um, and one of the things that we have heard from our community is that uh, links are helping run fiber across the city into areas that currently don't have fiber. Some of our concerns that we have are, one is the lack of clarity on how links watch the streets. And so thank you for uh, taking in a number of our questions and asking them um, to do it and to link and having this opportunity to hear um, how those links are watching our streets has been wonderful. Um, the lack of transparency or public particip participation around the updating of the privacy policy it was interesting to hear do it has sole control over the privacy policy uh, what would be great is if we can have some type of public review of that process and public engagement through that uh, updating of, of future privacy policies um, and then also it's interesting to see uh, intersection talk about the resources that are available for local businesses um, but it's not on their website and so having clear links for how to access uh, those types of resources would be great um, it's a, uh, right now it, it does take you to a web form and that's very ambiguous some of the opportunities that we've identified um, are the fact that uh, links are a critical uh, piece of infrastructure uh, around different civic institutions. Uh, we would love to see link, links surrounding uh, NYCHA developments. Uh, we would love to see links outside of every library, school, community board, district office, council district office, and senior center. Essentially, any place that has the potential to host a public meeting, we would love to have a Link NYC device there. So that way, there is an opportunity to figure out how to bridge that internet connectivity to that public meeting. Um, you know, I want to go back to this point about that links are bringing more than Wi-Fi. They provide the foundation for us to do our digital civics classes. Um, and then on top of that, they are literally stringing fiber across the city, which then enables for local businesses to tap into those uh, uh, fiber connections, which we've heard from our community is a critical component in making sure that businesses are brought into the 21st century. Um, and we would hope that the council, as you host future oversight hearings, really digs into, no pun intended, um, the conversation around how fiber is being pulled, because that is a fundamental component for the next 21st century New York City. And thank you. Thank you very much. I agree with all of you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have Andy uh, Penny and Zen Fai and Christopher Mendoza, um, C4Q, and Alex. Alex, uh, Alex, uh, Glaze Bloat from Older or from Oaks. Uh, and the last one is uh, Great Maze from A Better Jamaica. Push the button. Hi. Yeah. Thank, you, uh, thank you for having us. Thank you for holding this hearing about Link NYC. Uh, my name is Alex Glazebrook. I'm the Director of Training and Technology for Older Adults Technology Services and Senior Planet. Um, and I first wanted to thank the Council, especially uh, Chairman Koo, for their support of Oates' work and everything the city is doing to bridge the digital divide for older adults. Um, and I'm here today on, you know, not only on behalf of my organization, but also on behalf of um, all of the older adults that we serve in New York City. And um, we're here to express our continued support for Link NYC because we think it's a vital resource for the city. Um, we've been involved in this important work from the beginning. Um, the team that designed the kiosk was conscientious about accessible design and actually turned to us for support. Uh, we believe that these kiosks play a key role in bridging the digital divide by providing convenient free access to all New Yorkers. Uh, we know from the report that was just published by the Mayor's Office of the Chief Technology Officer um, that New York City, uh, a third of homes in New York City lack home broadband access and 
for there was also a big piece in the report about equity of broadband and New Yorkers of different ages are disconnected. So New Yorkers 65 and over are one and a half times more likely than other age groups to lack home broadband subscriptions. So the link NYCs play a very critical role for people who either can't afford broadband or just don't have it in their homes for whatever reason. Um, and New Yorkers over 65 are also three times as uh, likely to lack any home internet subscription at all, broadband or what have you. Um, so in light of these facts, uh, the Link NYC system serves as a critical resource for older New Yorkers who may lack access at home or elsewhere. Um, and Link NYC secure connection is safe enough for older adults to use for these purposes. Um, and we really think it's a amazing resource for the city. Just as a little side note, um, we've been experimenting with uh, robots. They're called telepresence robots. So think of it basically as Skype on wheels. Um, and they're robots that you can take control of remotely and actually wheel uh, around. So we've taken them to museums and stuff. But Link NYC is actually uh, creating access points where we can have people who are in their homes take control of our robots and go down the city streets and interact with people with the robots because of the Wi-Fi that's being provided by the Link NYC hotspots. I know that's kind of a strange application, but I th we, it's a cool application, and I think the boundaries are kind of limitless for the technology. Um, so I'll save going through all of the resources that Link NYC provides. Um, and we're also going to be partnering uh, with our uh, allies at Age Friendly to be uh, creating a campaign that's going to be displayed on the links for older New Yorkers. Um, to talk about the training we're doing and also resources in the city that apply specifically to older adults. Um, so thank you for having me and I'll keep it there. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Chris Mendoza. I am the uh, head of government affairs for C4Q, a coalition for Queens. And so thank you, Chair Ku and members on the Committee of Technology for the opportunity to testify today. Um, we're honored to have this opportunity to support Link NYC. Uh, C4Q, a little bit, is a nonprofit that aims to create opportunity through technology by teaching coding and professional skills to talented adults from diverse and low income backgrounds. Uh, through this, we hope to create and maintain a diverse tech community that is reflective of our society today. Since Link NYC launched in February 2016, the benefits have been clear uh, replacing antiquated pay phones with the smart city. C City kiosks are a vast improvement in look and impact while most importantly offering super fast free Wi-Fi to New Yorkers in every community for free. Uh, these innovative kiosks play a key role in bridging the digital divide and leveling the digital playing field for all New Yorkers. Um, in an additional note, I'd like to say that we used Link NYC last year throughout our application process as we were looking for students to apply for our program and we saw an uptick in applications as people were uh, putting in their applications that they saw the advertisement for our program in the Link NYC kiosk. Um, so it was an invaluable tool in helping us recruit the right people for our current class now. Uh, beyond their super fast free Wi-Fi, uh, Link NYC also provides useful services on the accessible tablet, such as free phone calls, maps, access to New York City services, uh, all with the purpose of establishing a more equitable and connected city. Um, off New, this Link NYC offers New Yorkers the opportunity to tap into Anthbert's database or 311, for example, to find food pantries, emergency housing, and other city services um, to make sure that New, that New Yorkers are getting the resources they need when they need them. Uh, we as well, and me personally, we enjoy all of the local news for useful information Link NYC displays on the digital screens, from weather and transit updates to community fun facts and local business information. Uh, thank you to the city and Link NYC for bringing this first of its kind project to New York City. I'm excited to see what's next with this unique digital platform and we're excited to continue working with Link NYC to increase the, uh, the application process of our program and to increase the diverse students that we accept into our program. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. I'm Greg Mays, Executive Director of A Better Jamaica. We're a community service organization based in Jamaica, Queens. We have about 16 or 17 programs. Uh, so let's see. Uh, since launching in February 2016, the Link NYC kiosks have replaced the eyesores that once blighted our streets. 
uh, with smart kiosks that not only display relevant advertising and information, but provide those without smartphones the opportunities to browse the web, make phone calls, and for people like me who come out with a dead phone, uh, the opportunity to charge their phones as well. Uh, so additionally, uh, Link NYC has allowed us to turn the kiosks into actual uh, art uh, exhibition space. So we have actually um, mounted two exhibitions, if you, if you will. Uh, they go for a month at a time, and I think in the handout that the uh, the uh, parliament, uh, the folk gentleman there gave you, you will see actually two of the key the two exhibits that we've launched. Um, they feature the work of local, um, locally based or focused on artists and stuff. So again, they're month long ones. The first was an exhibition from a photographer who has used St. Albans, a s section of Jamaica, to essentially just sort of exhibit and document that neighborhood. And the second is from, uh, so that photographer is 20-something years old. Uh, the second exhibition is by a painter who is about 84 years old. And again, we use the kiosk to just sort of feature about 10 of his works. So each artist got to just sort of exhibit 10 pieces of art. And we're presently, or I'm about to approach the Link NYC folks about our third exhibition, uh, which will feature the work of a woman artist who is based in Southeast Queens. Uh, so just a unique way for us, um, if we had to pay for the bus shelter space um, to use as an exhibition space, it would be out of uh, the range of what we could afford. So thankfully, have been working with the folks there to uh, provide this space on a remnant basis. And uh, finally, I'd just like to give a shout out to uh, Ruth Fasolt. Uh, I thought I was the only person who just sort of worked at 11.30 at night and midnight, and uh, we exchanged <laughs> emails uh, at that time quite a few times. So it's good to know that there are other just sort of workaholics out there trying to get the job done. Thank you. I'm glad all the public response are positive, mm -hmm. right? So we hope you can continue uh, to do more good work. Uh, thank you, Link NYC and uh, all the community advocates. Yeah. All right. So are there any more public uh, participation? Seeing none? No, this public hearing will be closed. Seeing none, this public uh, hearing will be closed. Thank you.